Good morning, Pastor Ron Jetter, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Grandview, Washington. The date, 8, 2020. Yeah, August 20th, 2020. A lot of 20s in there. If you have watched the news, you may have caught a story about a freak storm. Uh, the storm was called derecho, a Spanish word. Uh, and it described the path of the storm, which fairly narrow, nonetheless blew from west to east, the prevailing direction of weather in this country, starting somewhere in uh, maybe Illinois or Iowa, um, blowing straight across five states, a number of counties, not wide, but it devastated everything in its path where that storm with hurricane force winds, winds well over 90 miles an hour sustained with rain long enough to bring down grain silos, outbuildings such as large steel barns, uh, combines tumbling in the wind, and flattening corn especially corn, mostly corn, some soybeans, but mostly the corn, which this time of year in the Midwest relies on the sun. They get enough rain. It's amazing too, if you've ever seen corn in the Midwest, because it gets the same amount of rain, they don't irrigate, it's rain, and it's all exactly the same height. It's so amazing driving through Iowa. Uh, it, it's just a, a lovely sight, as opposed to out here, you can see where the irrigation got it, and it's very undulating, like the hills like the West uh, in our area here. But this freak storm, where did it come from? It, it didn't come from water where hurricane force winds developed, nor was it cyclonic like tornadoes would be. Uh, just a, a microburst that traveled 700 miles from West to East. And the corn is not even mature enough yet to harvest for seeds. And so they will lose a portion of this year's crop, but they'll also then lose a portion of next year's crop because as we all know, you don't eat all of your crop. You give some back to your silo for next year's seed and you give some to God. I was harvesting uh, peas, actually cleaning out the garden and here's one pea pod. You can see this one has six peas in it, and those are dried up. Uh, I haven't had water on them because it's well beyond the, the, the harvest season. I've got a number of pods, and I've got now hundreds of seeds, each of which can grow a vine. So I only planted eight vines, and on those eight vines, I got thousands and thousands of seeds. Talk about a hundredfold easily. Yes, these can actually last for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years waiting for water to germinate it and produce another pea plant. The seeds are so important, such an important part, and it only comes when that crop is allowed to mature, when nature and all the forces that, that work together allow that crop to mature. Because a mature crop says we've had a full season producing not just food for today, but seed for the future. In the book of Genesis, we've seen Abraham travel up and down, back and forth through the land of Canaan, uh, sometimes out to the coastal lands where the Philistines are near the Mediterranean, sometimes into the, the area, the plains by the Jordan River where their water can be used for, for crops, sometimes down to Egypt, which had the Nile and all the canals there. But water was the lifeblood Water, which we have in a scarcity and have to manage with canals and reservoirs and dams and dikes and so on, is the friend and the enemy of the Midwest. The friend when it comes at the right time and the enemy when it comes with severe wind and too much all at once causing these floods that can devastate crops and billions of dollars worth of equipment, water. But the traveling's not done. Weather 
seems to come in cycles, and we've seen that in the book of Genesis. And so there's going to be traveling back and forth, east and west, north and south, all because they have to find a way to sustain long-term agriculture and take advantage of where things are growing at the time, leaving where things aren't growing. We're in chapter 28 of the book of Genesis. Jacob has been sent away. His brother uh, Esau wants to kill him for tricking his father and stealing his blessing and his birthright. So Jacob has been sent back to the land where his, his grandfather Abraham came from, back where his mother came from, uh, in order to find a wife from among the daughters of his mother's brother. So go back and marry your cousins, just like your dad and I did. Yeah. Uh, so here we have verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba. And when you hear the word beer, think of water. And so whenever they, they name something beer this or beer that, there's a well there or a spring there. It's no wonder that the modern word beer means mostly water because that should tell us there's life, sustaining life giving water there. And wherever there had been abundant rain, there would be grasslands, pasture lands, and wherever there hadn't been, they had to keep those flocks moving. So when it says Jacob, think of Jacob as all of the flocks that his father has now given him, or is it just Jacob alone? Esau already has several wives and large flocks and herds and servants and so on. So it's, it's easy to assume that Jacob, being the same age as Esau, would also have an entourage of his own. So he's not going to be traveling alone. Verse 11, he came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. Ow! Really? What about your jacket? Uh, a, a shawl? A, a cloak? Anything? That, really? Well, there's a reason he slept on a stone. And the stone became his pillow as an excuse for then using that stone rather than something for comfort. It's the way they tell stories. Did he really use a stone? Or is it because that stone was used to create an altar? Uh, let's go ahead and say, yeah, he, he slept on that stone. Did he or didn't he? I don't know. How smart is Jacob? So there he is. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set upon the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood behind it, beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, the, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you will lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread across, spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. All the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. That's a first. We've seen God speak to Abraham. We've seen God speak to Isaac. And now God is speaking to Jacob. But this is a first where God says, Your offspring shall become a blessing to the earth. You don't exist for yourself. You're not the chosen people just to be a blessing to yourselves and each other. You're the chosen people in order that I may be the God of all the children of the earth. Back in 28 Genesis, we already see the foreshadowing of the message that Jesus will bring, a message the disciples resisted and resented, a message that Isaiah will reinforce. And this message is going to crop up over and over and over in little ways to remind us that God's people are not the Israelites alone. God's people are all the children of earth. And so we hear it here in Genesis 28. All the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Did the descendants of Israel see themselves as a blessing to all nations? Did all nations want to then say to Israel, how 
May we learn from you to be a blessing. How may we learn about your God? Well, that's the rest of the story of the Bible. But that's a theme then to hang on the wall. We've got several. Sin, judgment, grace, that pattern is still in force. But think of this other theme. How is God going to show himself and how is he going to challenge Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their offspring to be a blessing to all nations. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. He was afraid. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So he named that house of God, or in the Hebrew, Beth El. El being the name of God. Remember, we've got that hung on the wall as a theme. And Beth meaning house, house of God, Beth El. So this is going to be a place that is now revered throughout history as the place where God and God's angels come and go. Jesus will refer to it. He said, you will see the Son of Man descending with his angels. And it was in that place at Bethel, meaning God has now given a place on earth that is holier than any other, where God's ambassadors and God himself will come and go. But it is not humans who go up that ladder. It is God and the angels of God who come down and go up. It is heaven's ladder. Heaven owns the access to heaven. Heaven controls the access. It is God's decision how God comes down. We as Lutherans get that. It is not our works that get us up that ladder. It is God who freely comes down that ladder to us. See you tomorrow.